Hi, I'm Elizabeth Curry Chandler. I'm a journalist and writer who together with my husband co-founded the website Goodreads, an adventure that completely took over our lives. Today I'm editor-in-chief of Goodreads, and I'm still doing what I've always loved to do, interviewing and writing about creative and dynamic people. For this podcast, I'm talking to the world's most interesting people about what they're reading and why. Support for Books of Your Life comes from Audible, with an unmatched selection of audiobooks in every genre. Start a 30-day trial and your first one is free. Visit audible.com slash goodreads or text goodreads to 500500. Scott Harrison is the founder and CEO of Charity Water. It's a nonprofit that brings clean drinking water to people in the developing world. It's a staggering problem to try and solve. Almost one in 10 people on planet Earth don't have access to clean and safe water. Scott has written a memoir about his life and the evolution of Charity Water. It's called Thirst. We're in a studio in New York to talk about that and about some other books that have made an impact on his life. Welcome, Scott. So fun to be here. So tell me why you decided to write this book. Well, I I wanted to share my story, I think, in the hopes that it it might inspire other people. I mean, I think a lot of people have been talking about purpose these days, and it's almost become this buzzword, right, finding your purpose. And, you know, I was looking for mine uh, in all the wrong places. And as I talk about in the book, you know, I I was a club promoter, uh, kind of a degenerate club promoter for 10 years. And living in New York City as a hedonist, working at 40 clubs, and just looking for meaning in all the wrong places, in drugs and in, uh, in sex and in you know, fame and power. And uh, it left me really empty. And uh, you know, I, I read about a journey where I, I left it all behind and, and found, found purpose really in service. One of the parts of the book that I found really interesting was you went on a wild rager in Uruguay. And on that trip, at the same time you were reading the book, The Pursuit of God, Finding the Divine in Every Day, (laughs) uh, which led you to work on a hospital ship in West Africa and then found the nonprofit. Um, How'd you end up on the boat? (laughs) Well, you know, at this moment that I decided that I wanted to change my life and, and make it look opposite and volunteer... I started applying, as you would, to the humanitarian organizations that I'd heard of. And I applied to the Save the Children's and the World Visions and said, hey, you know, the Scott Harrison, the great nightclub promoter, is now ready for service. And I was denied by all these organizations. And at the time, it was so frustrating. And, you know, I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, here, here I'm getting a 1,000 people to stand outside nightclubs and spend $20 on cocktails and $500 on bottles of champagne. And no one will even let me volunteer for their organization for free. So the denials come in, and then finally this one organization says, well, if you're willing to go live in post-war Liberia and pay us $500 a month, then you can volunteer. And uh, I'm like, this is perfect. I actually am going to go broke volunteering. I mean, I was looking for the opposite of my life. Liberia at that time happened to be the poorest country in the world. It had fallen off the UN development charts because there was no data for 14 years after Charles Taylor I destroyed this country uh, with child child soldiers. And um, I had signed up in a heartbeat and uh, I dusted off an NYU degree in in journalism that I'd never used and and said, hey, uh, I'll I'll come and tell stories, uh, hopefully stories that matter. I'm interested just to talk about that transition moment. You know, you went from a club promoter to a guy on a ship in a tiny bunk with three strangers photographing people who desperately need medical care. How do you think your story would help people become better people, better humans. Well, you know, you, you mentioned this transition turn. So, you know, I'd, I'd grown up uh, in a very conservative Christian family, and I played by all the rules, and uh, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I didn't do anything I wasn't allowed to do. And then at 18, uh, the almost the cliche rebellion begins. And uh, it's funny, I, I feel sometimes like I, I lived out the parable of the prodigal son. You know, I gave everybody the middle finger and said, now it's my turn. And that led me, you know, down this path of of really darkness. The, the, the funny thing was on the outside, my life looked amazing. I mean, I was dating girls on the cover of fashion magazines. I was flying around the world to Paris and Milan and London. It was this jet set where on the outside, we wore nice clothes. We jumped in private planes and drank the best wine and champagne. But inside, pollution, rotting inside. And, um, you know, it was 10 years later that 
that on this trip in, in Uruguay, I just realized there would never be enough. It was, um, it was like the game of musical chairs where the music stopped and for the first time in my life, I didn't have a place to sit down. You know, I looked around and, and just felt unsettled. And uh, I did begin, you know, reading dense theology, hungover. So it was <laughs> funny contrast, you know. Felt like I was reading the exact opposite picture of my life. And, and that was really interesting. I've always been a, a pretty extreme person. So that led me to come back to New York City and sell everything I owned and eventually go to post-war Liberia as a photojournalist on this humanitarian ship. Yeah. Um, and I'm not saying everyone needs to go and sell everything <laughs> they own and go live in post-war Liberia on a humanitarian mission. But, you know, as as the story plays out, you know, I was able to find a real freedom in serving others and in, in the ability of, you know, using my time and my talent and my money to help others and not just this selfish endeavor, this selfish pursuit of more. Um, and I really hope that that other people might see a part of themselves in that experience. I think so many people... They are trapped, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. I mean, this is an old idea. And there's never enough, right? I mean, someone always has more. You know, one of my favorite quotes that, that I, I write about in, in the book is this idea of do not be afraid of work that has no end. And if you actually can move the intention of your life into service, and if you're looking to end suffering, if you're looking to help other people, then it's it's also an endless pursuit of more, it's just more in a very different direction. It's not more for yourself. It's more for others. And I think that's, you know, for me, that was completely transformational. Yeah. I mean, I think that story is extremely inspiring. And I, as a fellow founder, I really like your thoughts in the book about the need to inspire people through your branding. I think mm -hmm. that that goes all the way through to, to the actual nonprofit, almost the structure of the nonprofit. And I remember when we created Goodreads, we really wanted to inspire other people to read more. And you said in the book that when you looked at other charities for inspiration, you often you came up empty. It seemed like many used tools of shame or guilt to motivate people into giving. And I was curious to know in what ways you've tried to be different. I think, uh, as you mentioned, you know, shame and guilt, right? Everybody remembers those old commercials where the the sad child, the African child, looks up in slow motion, locks eyes with the camera. At that moment, a bunch of flies land on his face, and the 800 number comes up, right? And it's, please give now. And I think, uh, so that actually works, but it doesn't make people joyful. <laughs> you know, it's, it, they're giving out of this debt, out of this shame, out of this sense of obligation. And nobody wants to go and tell their friends about a charity that makes them feel like that. Nobody wants to wear that T-shirt. And, you know, it's interesting, you hear all this talk about giving back, right? Giving back. Oh, our company's giving back. I hate that language. I think it's, it's giving out of debt and obligation. You know, it's, it sounds like we've, we've pillaged and plundered to such extent that it's finally time to throw some scraps to the poor. Let's give a little back. And, you know, I think Charity Water has always tried to frame the act of giving in the positive. So I tell companies, just talk about your giving. Hey, we have a giving program at our company. We have a giving philosophy in our family. Um, frame it in the positive. So I think we have made it about hope and opportunity, and it's an invitation. You know, over a million people from over 100 countries have joined this mission, and we're just we're trying to say, hey, this is awesome. Like, what, what an amazing thing to be able to do. Isn't this fun? I mean, fundraising, first three letters are fun. Yeah, you do make it fun. I think people want to be a part of the club that is Charity Water. Well, it is fun. I yeah. mean, it's actually fun. I mean, I've been able to go to 69 countries now, uh, and I've been to Ethiopia 30 different times, and it is, it is fun to see villages and lives transformed through this basic need that, you know, many people listening have probably just taken for granted their whole life. I mean, I was born in a middle-class family in Philadelphia, and I've never had to drink bad water in my entire life simply because of the middle-class privilege I was born into. I didn't choose that. Any more than one out of every 10 people in the world chose to be born in Ethiopia or Malawi or Bangladesh or a village in Bolivia or Honduras without water. Yeah. Side note, I like the idea of not waiting until you make money to give back to. I think that concept... To give. See, now I'm going to start correcting you. Oh, it's to so give. In our, it's so in our <laughs> lexicon. <laughs> it is, it is. But I think there's a lot of that sort of delayed thinking about mm -hmm. charity with some people and 
but and people it, are missing out. Yeah. Um, there was a, a young entrepreneur uh, here in New York City, and, and he's, he's very, very successful. And his goal is to own the New York Jets. Uh, he was from New Jersey, and his, his goal is to own the Jets. And, you know, he was, he was going to do the, the Buffett thing. He was going to, you know, live his entire life, make as much money as possible, buy the Jets, and then think about giving back. And I met him at a conference nine years ago in Omaha, and we both shared a stage. And I just challenged him. I said, you're going to miss out on 30 or 40 years of engaging with social entrepreneurs, with causes that inspire you. Why would you wait until the end? So uh, he, he, he did. He jumped in right away, and he sits on boards now, and he's been very generous with our cause and a lot of other causes. And he talks about this from stage now and, and the joy and the benefit that he has gotten. Awesome. So why don't we talk about some of the books that you recommended as books okay. that have changed your life? I think Simplicity Parenting by Kim John Payne is at the yeah. top of that list. Yeah. Uh, if you can see my copy here, I have about 100 post-it notes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and nearly every page has something underlined. And I'm really curious, how did you come across this book and why did you choose it? Oh, my gosh. How did I come across it? Well, I think as a – I'm always asking people what their favorite parenting books are. Okay, so I have an almost two-year-old and my son is four tomorrow. But so I'm always asking parents, what are the best books uh, that you've read on parenting? And this came up. Um, from a couple people. And I think what what immediately attracted me to the book is, first of all, the title. <laughs> so you kind of know what you're getting into. Um, and I think parenting can feel complex. And the world that we're bringing our children into can feel uh, incredibly complex and, and confusing in some point. So a friend gave it to me. And you know, then it became one of those books that I give out to people. And um, I, I'll let I'll let you talk. I, I can tell you some of the things that we tried, but I want to kind of hear you talk oh, about no. your your reaction to it because you're you also have kids and I do. I have three daughters: seven, four, and two. Amazing. So, we can't imagine a third right now, Elizabeth. Uh, a lot of respect. One of the major themes in the book is that children have too much stuff and too mm -hmm. many choices. Mm -hmm. And he says, the author says that studies have shown that having lots of choices can erode our motivation and well-being. And then he says of kids he's worked with, these children, these very typical children from an affluent country of the Western world, were showing signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Our society, with its pressures of too much, is waging an undeclared war on childhood. Strong, right? Yeah. Those are some strong words. I was sort of struck by the concept that you can have too many books. Yep. But I mean, it expanded to toys. He, he says the average child receives 70 toys a year and cutting down schedules and ritual and rhythm and even easing off emotionally as a parent. I mean, those are a lot of really powerful things to adapt to your he life. Even, he even talks about practical stuff like light, you know, that, that our kids are often exposed to too much light. And, you know, if you want a kid to go to bed, you know, the lights really matter and the light affects mood. You mentioned the toys. That was that was one thing we tried. So he basically says, you know, look around your kid's room and look at it objectively, right? And then he says, throw out everything that's broken. Any, you know, robot that's missing an arm, if it's broken, so start there and throw it out. Then he says, take half and hide it. I remember listening to it on audio. Uh, my wife and I were doing a long road trip. And, you know, we're like, do you think this would work? And his premise is your kids won't notice it. So we did it. We put in a little storage unit in our building, and our son didn't say anything about it. It's so crazy. imagine that. Imagine taking half of you know you and your husband's possessions. But he didn't. And you know then he says, okay, now do it again. So he really challenges parents to have and then have again. And then he talks about you know kind of recycling the favorite toys. So you can move them away and then bring them back in. And he talks about how how to like bring a family together, the relationships of it. I, I've often thought about how just being together, doing nothing together as a family seems like the ultimate luxury. Mm -hmm. And he says things like relationships are forged in pauses. And you also mentioned that feeling in Thirst when you talk about Africa time. Yeah. Yeah. Things are, you know, sitting under the mango tree just in silence with the village elders. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, um, yes. one of the most unbelievable films. I was I was in Brooklyn um, on date night with my wife, and I remember going afterwards to the 
the guy's bathroom and there were like 15 guys in there sobbing. I mean, we're, we're all washing <laughs> oh our God. faces with water from the basin. It was kind of gross. But uh, what I loved about that, too, I think um, really connects to Simplicity Parenting is that he's like, we don't give kids enough credit. You know, we're constantly talking down to them. And, you know, he does this thing in the movie, which is just brilliant. He says, hey, kids, do you want to know how long a minute is? And then he sets a minute timer and he sits there in silence for 60 seconds. <laughs> and you watch this egg timer go from 60 to 59 to 58. And in, in the film, they juxtapose what else was happening at the time. And it's this, um, it's the Tom and Jerry's. It's the Roadrunner skidding, um, Transformers, Transor Z, you know, GoBots, all the, these kind of high, fast cutting, frenetic energy and then you have Mr. Rogers sitting around with an egg timer. And I think as a parent, you're like, the egg timer's healthier. That pause, that space for a child to have an imagination is way more powerful. Um, and I think, you know, if we think of our environments and clutter, it's hard. It feels like a challenge, doesn't it? Oh, it completely. And I think it's also the scheduling. There's the events you have to take your kids to and birthday parties and activities. And, mm -hmm. and, and we both live in a city. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm in New York City. I mean, there's fire trucks and sirens and, you know, and in some sense, I think you, I, I really try and look at the positive of that. I mean, my kids are not skittish, you know, when you no. do grow up in that kind of environment, you know, there's a fearlessness that comes with it. But, but we're always looking for spaces and pause to, you know, to retreat. Um, okay, then I have to ask you about this controversial quote. This is the one I starred, I think, four times okay. because I just thought, oh, I don't know how this will play with people. And I think I've certainly failed at this, but Payne says that if either parent spends more than 10 hours a day at work, including travel, then their child will suffer. 15 hours a day almost guarantees damage. And then he goes on to add that the emotional problems, addictions, and all sorts of other things that are pretty much every parent's nightmare are more likely to occur. So... I don't know whether you're CEO or a truck driver. I mean, all of us at times have long hours at work. And, um, you know, how do you reconcile these opposing forces as a parent and a CEO? I, I try to keep it under 10 um, when I'm home. So I, I, I've configured life. So uh, let me just start at the beginning. One of the challenges is that I'm on the road a lot. I'm doing 60 flights a year. And about 30% of the nights I'm not in my bed and about 70% I am. So when I am home in New York City, those 70% of nights. We live seven minutes away from the office. Um, I do every morning and every night that I can. So I'm waking up with the kids, doing breakfast, and then I'm home at six. So that, you know, I will sometimes work when they go back to sleep, but I'm getting seven to nine in the morning and six to eight. So I feel like I'm getting four hours. That's, that's you know, I, I won't commute. So, you know, for, for what we pay for a 1,200 square foot apartment, you know, it's a nice house an hour away. So that, that really helps. And I've also started taking my son on the road with me because he's, he's starting to become more portable. So now that might actually run counter to Simplicity Parenting as it talks about rhythms and these routines. I, I don't know. That's going to probably be the tension. But I want him to see what dad does. I want him to see the world. I want him to I want to instill this sense of adventure and travel and experiencing other cultures and whether that runs counter to the you know the routines and the rhythms, I, I think it does, but we'll see. I think I'm willing to make that trade off. Yeah. So we should probably talk about your second book recommendation and the last book we're going to talk about, David Allen's How to Get Things Done, The Art yep. of Stress-Free Productivity. Allen is a well-known productivity consultant who has created a time management system that he describes in his book. This is, I feel like this book hit me 10 years ago, um, the principle is almost so simple. It's you got to write everything down. And he just has a system for lists and triaging the how to take the ideas in your head. And, you know, I'm a I'm a probably, you know, sometimes too creative, scattered thinker where, you know, two, three hundred ideas, you know, will come in the space of a couple hours sometimes. And there's no worse feeling than losing them. Now, I have tons of bad ideas, and that's what he helps you do. He just says, when it comes in, you write it down, and then he gives you the system of triaging the stuff that you do now, the stuff you do later, the stuff you actually toss. You know, I remember this analogy in the book, and he said, okay, so let's say you uh, need batteries in your radio, 
Okay. So you just tell yourself, oh, the next time I'm at the store, I'm going to go get batteries. He said, but is that the way it works? No. You go to the store, you do all your shopping, you get home, you look at your stupid radio and say, oh, forgot to get the batteries. How is that possible? And he said, the minute that you write that battery thing down, you clear that space. You actually yeah. clear the mental debt. Because there's, right, we've all had these moments like, oh, I have to remember. Oh, I have to remember. That's actually stressful. Super stressful. And it like builds up. There's the 10 or 15 things I have to remember to do. So having a system, you know, whether it's on paper or in a device, I actually use an app called Clear. It's a list building app where you can kind of move things up and down in priority and color code it. Um, it's very simple, but just writing it down, like freeze the event, like you can sleep at night. The pieces that were really helpful for me were, was the two minute rule. Mm -hmm. If you can do something in under two minutes, you should do it right then. And then cross it off. I never did that. And I always have all these little two minute things that are mm -hmm. just, again, causing that low level anxiety. So that was really helpful for me. And I also really liked the idea of converting the task into what is the next action I need to take. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great way of breaking yeah. down projects. That's great. So he says whenever you are making a list, you don't say batteries. You say buy batteries. So it has to be this actionable thing. It wouldn't be um, French. You know, you wrote down. Yeah. <laughs> and you might yeah. mean like, I want to learn French. And he would even say, learn French is bad. What's that first step? You know, is it go buy Pimsleur French? or go by the Berlitz, take your first lesson in French. So he's, he's saying all of these things need to be actionable. I don't know. I, this may seem, sound so basic to people, but I just wasn't writing enough things down. I was trying to hold them in my memory. And it's just, it's really been transformative to just productivity for me. So it was 10 years ago, you read yeah. the book, and now you're a productivity no. machine. No, because my <laughs> to-do list in my general clutter file is 437 items. <laughs> So, so I also do feel like I'm behind and, you know, again, because I'm only working nine to six, right? If I was putting in t 10 or 12 hours a day, I'd probably have it, I'd have it down. So I, I triage on planes and I delete stuff and, um, and get it done. Do uh, you do the weekly done. review process that he talks not as, about? Not with the diligence that I should. Okay. The, the other thing that's, that really helps me is I calendar everything. So I'm just, if I need to send three important emails, I will create a 15 minute calendar block to do those three emails. So I kind of use the calendar as well as a to-do list for the most important things. Well, just what's next for Charity Water? Oh, I'm really excited about the book to come out. And, you know, it's been almost two years of, of writing and a lot of stories in the book that I've never been able to tell before. Uh, when my wife read it, she, you know, a couple people have said something through the lines of, oh my gosh, I can't believe you actually told people that. <laughs> you know, there was there was a little sense of, you know, whether it was just... Uh, some of the darkness and drugs around nightlife or there's, you know, there's stories of guns and lawsuits and, you know, death and really, really happy stories as well. So I'm, I'm excited for that to, to come out in October. And we have this amazing donor that read the book and put up $300,000 um, so that anybody who pre-ordered the book would unlock a $30 donation awesome. um, to get 10,000 people clean water, which was, which was really cool. So I think the book is already starting to help people. And, and we're just really trying to fight to grow the organization, grow the movement, and see a day on earth when everybody has clean water. We've been able to help 8.2 million people get water, but there are 663 million people that need help. So we're at 180th of the problem solved. So in some ways, it really feels like we're at the beginning of this very long journey. That's awesome. Well, Scott, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. This is fun to be, uh, uh, we're like at the very beginning of this that you're going to do, you're going to have some of the, the most amazing authors on in the future. Can't, I can't wait to hear what's next. Me too. We'll see what happens. Scott Harrison is the founder and CEO of Charity Water. His new memoir is called Thirst. You can learn more about Charity Water at charitywater.org. Books of Your Life is produced by me, Elizabeth, and Melissa Yeager-Miller. Our theme was composed by Mia Schettino. Thanks to Argos Studios in New York City and Craig Billmeyer. You can find this podcast and all the books we discussed with Scott Harrison on Goodreads in the book group, Books of Your Life with Elizabeth. You can also connect with your fellow readers there. Audiobooks from Audible are a great way to get more books in your life. 
With the free Audible app, you can listen while commuting, doing chores, working out, anytime, anywhere, on any device. Audible's unmatched selection includes my guest Scott Harrison's recommendation, Simplicity Parenting. Get it free along with two selected Audible original titles when you start a 30-day trial or choose any other audiobook. To get started, just visit audible.com slash goodreads or text goodreads to 500500.